Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Very excited to talk about my journey through open source and what I'm building next, a company I co-founded last year called T. I always have been a bit of an open source person. I got into programming via open source. I have a chemistry degree, not a computer science degree. I discovered after doing about a year of chemistry that actually chemistry is an incredibly boring subject. I fell into this funk and discovered Linux. I got involved in open source and for years participated, but what I'm known for most is homebrew. Who here is a developer? And uh, who here uses or knows open, uh, homebrew? Yes. That's, uh, that's pretty much the nature of it. When I was making it, I didn't realize how phenomenally successful it would become, but I had a feeling. I had a feeling about it. I started building it at a company I worked at in London because we had six apps. Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, iPhone, and even a BlackBerry app. For a very brief time, there was a BlackBerry app store. And uh, I'm glad it doesn't exist anymore, frankly, based on the SDK, which was a nightmare. But these kinds of nightmares led me to complaining incessantly about the state of trying to work with all this different open source and all these different platforms. I complained so much that one of my coworkers told me to shut up and do something about it. So I went home and I did something about it. After a few weeks, I realized that actually I built something that was kind of cool, so I open sourced it. This is the homepage today, and it was the homepage then. The truth is, I built something that was very useful to a lot of people. And part of that reason is because it turns out that 97% of commercial code contains open source software. And I built this tool which made it so that people could easily consume, use, and do things with that open source. When I open sourced it, this is the video, it very quickly gained a lot of interest. At first, it was just me zipping around doing the work. But then suddenly, after a few months, there was thousands of people contributing. This wasn't an accident. I designed it from the start so that other people would contribute. The reason being, uh, I'm lazy, you see. Just like all the best developers are, I wanted everyone else to do the work. So I made it viral in a way that, frankly, I don't think any open source project has since. By many metrics, open, uh, Homebrew is actually one of the most successful open source projects of all time. And I uh, nurtured this community there. And that's the, uh, the utopic vision for open source, that you nurture a community, and then that community gets involved. You all find the passion together, and you find that purpose, and you build it. Of course, in reality, the problem is developers need to eat. I had a full-time job, and homebrew was another full-time job. In fact, it was more like a job and a half. I barely slept. I didn't do as much work at a paid job as I should. And I uh, loved working on homebrew, and I didn't want to stop. So I quit. I quit the paid job. I saved up a bit of money. And for six months, I had a wonderful time maintaining and building this product that was making the whole world take notice of open source and what we could do. And then I ran out of money and I had to get a job again. And frankly, my whole career has been this, where I would save up a bit of money, uh, doing two full-time jobs, then quit so that I could go back to working on open source. And I, there's something that's not right about that, right? It's not as though I never got anything for my work, the tens of thousands of hours that I put into open source over my life. One Christmas, Square sent me an iPad. It had a little uh, tag on it saying, thanks for homebrew, Max, we all use it. And like, the subtext was like, and we make a lot of money using all this open source that we get for free. And one year, Google sent me a blanket. And you know what? I really liked that blanket. It was really large, it was soft, and it was warm. And I needed it to be warm because I couldn't afford heat. Thanks, Google. But the problem isn't just with remuneration. This is a famous comic by XKCD called Dependency. It refers to the tower of open source. And I really like that analogy by itself. For me, open source is something where when you create something and the community embraces it, it becomes this block that's added to the tower. And now after it's added, 
It's almost never removed. Everything is built on top of that, step by step, over the years. And this comic points to this one little pillar that's fragilely holding up the entire internet down in the corner, maintained by some random person from Nebraska since 2003. The truth is, there are projects like this. We call them Nebraska projects after this comic, and we call the whole problem the Nebraska problem. Now, every now and again, one of these Nebraska projects does get upheaved, and the internet suffers. Last December, this project called Log4j, that really nobody had ever really heard of, there was an exploit found in it. And suddenly, the whole internet had this massive root exploit. You could uh, root a Minecraft server just by typing a certain string into the chat. Everyone panicked. All these enterprises were like, what the hell is this Log4j thing? The Log4j people were getting emails from enterprise solutions who assumed they were paying these people to maintain this software because they didn't understand how open source works. So they were getting all this abuse online and elsewhere. On Twitter, they quite reasonably said, hey, look, we'll fix the bug. But like, we are an unfunded open source project maintained by a team of volunteers. Maybe you big enterprises that make so much money using all this open source could throw us a bit of funding once we fix the bug. So the enterprises said, yeah, sure, we'll fix the bug first, we'll send you some money. They're still unfunded. The truth is, I've been trying to figure out how to solve this funding problem my entire open source career. I want to work on open source. People like me are passionate about what we build in the open source communities and how it is used to build the internet. I've tried a few things. I had a Patreon for a bit. I uh, managed to get it up to $800 a month. And uh, that took me three months and 40% of my time. And I was like, I don't want to spend 40% of my time marketing myself for not enough to pay my rent. So I've been looking. And like last year, I, uh, I realized that maybe I could do something with crypto. Well, I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking the same thing. Isn't uh, crypto just like scam coins and JPEGs? Usually JPEGs of various nonchalant animals. Well, they were calling it Web3 now. And that's a whole new web, right? It's plus one. So there must be something to it. You wouldn't call it Web3 if you, you, you've got to be confident about what you're delivering, if you're going to call it that. So I, I took a look, had a look into it. And I found that Web3 is, in fact, perfect for open source, because open source is about generating value via the community. And Web3 is about generating value via the community. I realized that blockchain can empower developers to contribute to open source while reaping overdue benefits. So I sat down, and I thought about it, and I came up with the idea for T. T is the successor to Brew. It's been a while since I made Brew, and I never thought I'd make another one. But when I realized that using crypto, we could fund the entire open source ecosystem, I wanted to build a new one. I've come up with T from the, the principles of Unix. It was the principles of Unix that got me into open source in the first place. I fell in love with Linux and the command line. I loved all those tiny little tools that do one thing and one thing well, and then you combine them into pipelines, and then the sum of the parts is greater, or the, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I love that about that. So with T, we came up there from the beginning. This is how all open source and products in general should be built, in my opinion. Also, fundamentally, we want to say that funding shouldn't be the reason that your open source project fails. I want people to be able to build important pieces of open source. All this open source builds the internet. It runs it. It keeps it going. I want them to be able to do that without worrying about how they're going to pay bills. These people should be funded to maintain this software. We're intending to build a better internet that gives recognition back to the developers, credit for their work, and allows them to continue working on these projects without having to go and chase a job at Fang. I genuinely want for all these developers who work at Fang companies to, once T is running, 
quit their jobs and earn just as much money by contributing genuine value to the world, not just tweaking Facebook's ad algorithm, making sure people like stupid content. That's a waste of incredible talent. We consider it our digital revolution. I tried to fund myself doing open source with Patreon and other sponsorship methods. The uh, $11 a month I make on GitHub sponsors is not that helpful. Sponsorship turns open source into a charity. Open source is not a charity. Open source is vital infrastructure for the internet and for all of our software. Bounty programs I also don't like. They put an agenda behind what kind of features and items get into open source. The person making the bounty is paying for something that maybe is not best for the community, which is also why I don't like how over the last 10 years, an awful lot of open source developers have ended up getting employed by major corporations that use that open source. That's kind of their gesture towards it, right? They're like, hey, we're a big web two company. We've made millions off open source, so we'll hire someone. The problem there is that that company then has an agenda towards how that open source project works. Open source needs to be man managed by the community. They're the ones that know what it's for, what it should be used for, and how it should be directed. And you are starting to see rough patches with some of these hires, like Google's Kubernetes team are having a, a problem where they can't maintain their developers there. T itself is a suite of products. It is a package manager, but also it's this blockchain component. We're putting the package registry on chain. It's a logical place to put it. It's an immutable database. We no longer want to have left pad incidents. If you remember the left pad incident, uh, it, was, it was a while ago, but the maintainer of it yanked it from the internet due to, uh, well, at least in part, the fact that he wasn't getting funded for all the work he did. And it caused the internet to break down for a few days because uh, it was a vital package in a, an enormous graph of open source software. So by putting this data online in a, a blockchain, it's immutable and it cannot be removed. And that's how open source needs to work. And it adds a bunch of extra security features as well, which we're really excited about. And we're gonna have a token. So a package manager is actually the perfect place for this kind of thing, because we know the entire graph of open source software. We know how all the packages are related to each other. These, this dependency information is in fact a kind of page rank that helps us know which projects are actually the most important projects in all of open source, allowing us to direct the token to those projects especially. When token enters our system, it will be redistributed from where it enters to the dependencies of those packages and down and down each time. This means that projects like Log4j that nobody really knows about will still receive funding because that's a real problem with the current funding systems that we have, that only favorites really get any sponsorship because open source is 300, 400,000 packages. Nobody knows all of them. No company knows all of its packages. But with T, your company could know exactly what open source it's using precisely. We'll tell you, and then you can inject some token into that graph and help fund the entire open source ecosystem. The truth is, we don't need a lot of token to be injected. I had a project called PromiseKit, probably my second most famous open source project. At its peak, it was used by 100,000 apps. So I was maintaining it for free. And I was like, if every one of those apps just gave me a dollar a year, I could do this full time. The truth is, little bits of money go a long way. Well, I'm incredibly excited to announce that we are launching the T Package Manager today, right this second. It's alive. You can go to T. Thank you. You can go to t.xyz and uh, check it out, but don't do it yet. Do it after the presentation. All right. uh, it's, I'm very excited about the features. I think it's like my best ever piece of work. 
We are not exactly a package manager, honestly. We're a, a, a universal virtual environment manager. We're a universal interpreter. We're a unified dependency manager. So how does it work? Well, magic, of course. I always like to put a bit of magic into my tools. I think that a, a product should feel magical. It should know what your intent is before you do it so that you're not worried about what it's doing. Like this whole tooling, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I know that you all hate it. It's, uh, it's tedious, it's in the way. You wanna get on with your app. You wanna be building your app. And I want you to be building your app because that is the cool stuff. That's the stuff that's advancing humanity. So T is magical, it's delightful. It knows what you're doing. When you step into a new directory with T, it automatically loads your dependencies. You don't have to install them. They're already there. They're already there and they're already versioned exactly how you want it. No longer do you have to use, <coughs> excuse me, the myriad of different version managers or Docker to version your dependency stack. T's doing that for you. If you give T a script, it figures out how to run it. It doesn't need you to install Python first or Go or Ruby. It doesn't matter where it's from, the internet, locally on your computer, Inside that script, if you need some pip modules, you can tell T to install those pip modules. If you need other dependencies, say you want to write a script that converts images and you want image magic, it's a very useful tool, uh, still exists, uh, it's very powerful, so you want to use it. You can install whatever dependencies you need. They only exist on your system during the execution of the script. We don't install anything globally, we're not messing up the rest of your computer. That's just a few of the uh, features that we're bringing to TCLE. It's out today. Go and check it out. We're also having a launch party tomorrow. So if you go to t.xyz slash Lisbon, you can sign up to come. It's on the roof. I've been told it's going to be extremely awesome. And uh, I would love to talk to you about what T can do and also how you can contribute. This is a real open source project. From the start, I want to see you on GitHub. Thank you very much.